Okay, we're recording now, just so you guys know. Great, so uh, by way of introduction, uh, I am Jeremy Winokur. I'm a rabbi um, through the conservative movement and I've been up and down the East Coast from Washington DC to um, about an hour outside New York City. And now I'm in Wilmington, Delaware. And I've been teaching in the Limud program, the Hebrew school for Temple Beth El for a number of months. And uh, I'm excited to bring this adult learning opportunity. Um, the I Engage curriculum is an ongoing uh, learning experience through the Hartman Institute, Shalom Hartman Institute, um, based in both Jerusalem and uh, New York. Um, is a pluralistic Jewish think tank is probably the wrong word because it's more um, involved in terms of the idea of bringing people together to discuss big issues through the lens of values and texts of our tradition so that um, even if we disagree or we come to different conclusions, we can see how we share similar assumptions, um, or uh, if we delve deeper, we can see the basis for some of the assumptions that we make, and that will enrich our uh, ability and opportunity to talk to each other. Rabbi Bitran has taught, uh, I engaged before, it was called Dilemmas of Faith. The curriculum that I will be teaching is called Together and Apart, uh, and uh, they're always focused on Israel in some way. This particular curriculum is focused on uh, Israel and North America uh, and what it means to be a Jew. This is much more about Jewish identity. So I see we just had someone join us um, and I wanna say welcome. I am going to, in a moment, share my screen. Uh, hello. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, make available to you uh, some resources that you can access in your own time in addition to during our class. Um, and as uh, Debbie indicated, we're gonna record this session in part because of the confusion as to whether we are starting this week or next week. Or So I'm gonna treat the three of you as like ongoing students. We're not gonna repeat the class um, uh, uh, with you in it. Um, and, and we can provide the recording to anyone who wants to kind of catch up and that way uh, the next class will, will kind of be a continuation. Um, let me bring here. So again, the curriculum is called uh, Together and Apart, the Future of Jewish Peoplehood. Uh, and it's a product of the uh, Shalom Institute, Machon Shalom Hartman. Uh, and this is a part of Bethel's uh, adult education offerings. So. Excited to be here together with you. And what we're gonna to try to do today is um, hear a little bit more about what iEngage is and this particular curriculum. I'm gonna let Danielle Hartman uh, say more about that himself through a video. I'm gonna go through some of the logistics in terms of, again, these materials that will be available to you uh, offline in addition to the class that like we're in here right now on Zoom. And, go over how that relates to the schedule that um, Debbie and I have set up. Uh, and to remind you that like however much this is about learning, it's also about relationships. And so I hope to get to know you and uh, by extension that you get to know me and maybe you'll even get to know each other better than you may already do. Um, and the focus of today's session is gonna be really on stories. Um, the sort of like idea that stories help to define who we are um, and uh, I, will, I will touch a little bit on the extent to which that is really important and really visible today. Uh, but our, our story about ourselves in Israel is in, in particular um, uh, part of this class. Um, and that, that those stories can be complex, right? It's not always like that you're the same person feeling the same way or having the same relationship uh, throughout all time. Uh, it can be complicated both in the moment and over time. Uh, then we're gonna look at some of the sources that uh, can help to enrich that conversation. And, and then I will uh, give you some ideas in preparation for our next class. Questions before I dig in a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
No? Okay. I will say this, um, uh, that you, for Zoom etiquette, um, uh, feel free to uh, either mute yourself or take yourself off mute um, if you want to ask a question. You can interrupt me at any time. Um, likewise, uh, um, I was discussing with Debbie how you know scheduling is what scheduling is. So I'm teaching this class for another congregation as well, and um, it's close to dinner time for that class. So I tell people that they should feel free, even with their screen on, to eat or drink because we're building community together. Um, that being said, if, if you're not comfortable um, with your video on um, for any particular reason, um, uh, it's okay to not have it on. Um, but but don't be shy uh, if it's just because you are having Shabbat lunch um, still at this point because uh, it's only 1.15. Okay, so I'm going to let Danielle Hartman speak for the curriculum. Danielle Hartman is the son of David Hartman. Uh, Rabbi David Hartman is a um, rather famous Jewish philosopher, writer, um, and thinker. He founded the Shalom Hartman Institute. Um, he was uh, a very prominent rabbi in Montreal. So um, for those of you who travel across the border frequently to say Toronto, like a slightly different Jewish community, but, but very similar. And um, when David Hartman got to Israel, he realized that, that really the sort of secular religious divide uh, troubled him greatly, that, that there was a whole kind of Judaism that was not being expressed, let alone talked about. Um, and, and so he, he founded the Institute to again, build this idea of, of pluralism in action. Uh, and uh, Danielle grew up, you know, literally uh, uh, at his feet um, and, has, has taken the helm uh, admirably, uh, has published himself as well, um, and is, is a great spokesperson for uh, pluralist Judaism in Israel and uh, around the world. So what I'm gonna do now is change what I'm sharing to share his, ooh, hold on one second. Um, yeah, we'll do it this way to um, indicate to you. So I, one of the things that you'll get access to is this online portal. This is Rabbi Patron's because there's, there's only, they only let <laughs> one um, community leader um, sign in. So for, for Beth L, this is like the leader sign in. Um, and if I scroll down, you can see Dilemmas of Faith is the course that Rabbi Patron taught in the past. Um, but if you were to log in, you would see something very similar to this, just without the leader's guide. And I'll show you how to log in in uh, a little bit. Um, but if you just click like this, it will load the video, which I'll make a little larger. We're just gonna watch four minutes. Welcome to I Engage Five, entitled Together and Apart, The Future of Jewish Peoplehood. Our goal through I Engage is to create new possibilities for a strong and vibrant connection between Israel and world Jewry. Our work is founded on the belief that there is no Judaism without Jewish peoplehood and that Jewish identity is enriched and strengthened when Israeli Jews and Jews around the world see each other as essential parts of a larger whole. It's an extraordinary feature of history that the Jewish people have managed to maintain feelings of solidarity and a common sense of peoplehood despite Jewish communities being separated from one another for centuries by geography, language, and cultural difference. These circumstances may have led us to expect more fragmentation and assimilation, and perhaps even disappearance as a distinct people from the world arena. However, a unique set of external and internal factors help Jews to retain our singular form of peoplehood. Now, following the Holocaust and the establishment of Israel, close to 90% of Jewish life has become more concentrated in two central locations, Israel and North America. 
Nevertheless, Zionism and the return to our ancient homeland itself in the 20th century served as a major source of Jewish unity, which transcended denominationalism and created deep feelings of common identity and connection. In recent years, however, we are increasingly aware of the fact that Jews in Israel and in North America have embarked on different historical and often ideological trajectories. We are separated not merely by thousands of miles and dramatically dissimilar environments and dangers, but by an ever-growing sense of disparity on issues of identity, religion, politics, values, and priorities. Real questions have been asked about whether Jewish peoplehood, in the way that it has been traditionally understood as a global family, with its self-evident sense of loyalty and relationships, is compelling. At the deepest level, we may be witnessing the crumbling of a meta-narrative that has transcended boundaries and united Jews for generations, the consequences of which could constitute a redefinition of Jewishness in exclusively religious or cultural terms, devoid of its peoplehood dimension, which served as so essential a component for Jewish identity, vitality, and survival. These new realities require that we create new language and paradigms for understanding and maintaining the relationship between Jews in Israel and across the world, and new ways to talk with each other through which this relationship can be reconceived. I engage five as an attempt to do precisely that. In this series, we will embark on an exploration of the concepts of Jewish peoplehood, its most significant contemporary challenges and stumbling blocks, and finally, attempt to suggest different meta-narratives that can unite the Jewish people today. The I engage methodology is grounded in an aspirational values-driven discourse, which works to identify and develop values which we can share while respecting our diverse political and ideological positions. Our aim is to create a conversation that transcends partisan divides and which goes to our underlying values instead of their political manifestations. When it comes to the issue of the future of Jewish peoplehood and the consequent relationship between Israel and world Jewry, we will explore which models, conceptual categories, and ideas can sustain peoplehood and a connection to Israel today and into the future. Which assumptions and belief structures need to be reimagined or discarded? How do we embrace our increasingly wide cultural and political differences and still work to create frameworks for relationships that can connect Jews to Israel and to each other? He goes on to uh, talk a little bit more about the specifics of the curriculum, which I'll get into. Um, and, uh, and then what follows in that video, if you saw that it was 50 minutes long, is a, a lecture by one of the Hartman Institute scholars. And that lecture is followed by um, a conversation um, between the scholar and uh, two other uh, people. And in this particular case, for that first video, it's uh, Rabbi Angela Bukdal and uh, Rabbi Dotan Ariely. Um, and I'll say more about their interview towards the end of class. Um, so again, the, the goal of I Engage largely, right, a, a decade uh, long project, um, and, and this is number five in the series, is to help to discuss Jewish peoplehood in a way that allows for a conversation about the relationship between Jews in Israel, um, uh, Jews in Israel and Jews uh, around the world and Israel. Uh, and the uh, I Engage number five, the curriculum that we're gonna be going through called Together and Apart uh, is very much focused on uh, the sort of contemporary version of the questions as they come up around peoplehood uh, and um, I'm going to uh, kind of go through the curriculum to, to let you see what it looks like uh, when we say that uh, the course is gonna focus on the idea of going from no home to one home and, and in some ways, you know, to, to be away from home, right? Uh, to then two homes. 
Um, and so when we talk about Jewish peoplehood, the degree to which uh, a, a people is defined by a place, what did it mean for Jews before we had any version of Israel? What did it mean when we had Israel and were exiled from it? What does it mean today when really truly, right, statistically and also in terms of a lot of language, Jews are at home in Israel, right, and at home in North America? Um, uh, so let me go back to my... Um, uh, oh wait, I'm going to have to change this in a moment. So we're going to switch to and go back to here and share this screen. Here we go. Back to my slideshow. And so, um, okay, what you saw is one of the resources from the online um, aspect of Hartman. Uh, and the Hartman Institute. So uh, Debbie will help in uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to distribute this image, this flyer. But if you go to online.hartman.org.il for Israel, as opposed to um, uh, just ending with .org for the United States, um, that will give you a chance to create your own account with Hartman. And you'll use this particular code that is specific to Bethel. Okay, and that will um, give you any time access, not only to the curriculum that we're going to look at, but also to the one that Rabbi Bichon taught in the past, Dilemmas of Faith. You can watch all the videos and you'll have um, uh, access also to a PDF, meaning an online version of the source book. Okay, so um, here's the thing. You don't have to do that unless you want to be able to watch the videos uh, in your own time and, and in full. Um, the way I'm going to teach the class is that it, it's enough to just show up uh, and and see what I show, but I'm not going to show a whole half hour block. Um, I, I'd rather talk with you, uh, take your questions, um, than, than sit here and, and watch somebody else talk to both of us. Um, so another way to access the source material, um, this is a hyperlink, the link to purchase. Um, let me just stop sharing so it's very obvious. And let's see, um, can I spotlight myself? Hold on. No, okay. So um, this is a printed version of the uh, curriculum. You can see it's about an inch thick, okay. And uh, I will tell you that I made a mistake <laughs> of downloading the PDF and uh, trying to just read it online. And it worked for this or that page, but like to get a scope of everything, that was too much for me. So I, I put it onto like a thumb drive and I took it to Staples so they would print it for me. And it was like $60, cause it's like 300 pages. You can get this for like less than 15, including shipping. <laughs> through that link, because um, the Hartman Institute made it available as a book through lulu.com. Um, and again, I'll, we'll get you that link again, but it's it's in this slideshow uh, and you can just click, um, uh, you can just click on where I say here, link to purchase, okay? Uh, it does take a good 10 days to two weeks to receive. So you won't necessarily have it for next week um, for our class, but uh, you don't, need it again uh, unless you want it and um, you know if you're the kind of person who who likes to uh, have it all in front of you great um, because our class is on Shabbat I'm not going to encourage you to take notes um, but I, I will um, uh, let you know that uh, once the recording of the class is uploaded and I have a link that I can send you um, uh, I put together an email with what I call enduring lessons. So all the major takeaways um, that will kind of help to trigger um, things that we talked about in, in case you forget them, which goes to this point that class is live. Like you could just come and be a part of the class and, and in theory, that's enough. But given that we're in this very unusual period in, in our lives and in history where often we're stuck at home, 
uh, and you ha may have extra time. You might not, but if you do, you might want to, again, access all those recorded materials. Um, and, uh, and that being said too, that something might come up where you're not able to join us on any given particular Saturday at one. Uh, and so please know that uh, Debbie and I are arranging for the sessions to be recorded. Uh, and then I can share that recording with you. Questions about materials, necessities, No, okay. Um, so here is uh, something of the, what we'll call the syllabus. If you open the curriculum, right, either the PDF or the printed version, you will see that actually I engage is set up to have uh, 14 units, 14 units in three parts. Uh, I took the liberty of condensing it uh, significantly um, so that we can get this all in before Passover. I think that will be pretty meaningful. And also for those of you who've been tracking like pandemic life, it'll help finish the, the sort of one year uh, experience of, of how we've been thinking about and experiencing time. Um, and I did this with the advice and um, advice consent and actually guidance um, uh, of people at the Hartman Institute uh, who have taught the class uh, and who help rabbis figure out how to teach the class. So today we're gonna do unit one from no home to two homes. And you can see that today we're doing introduction and then one from one no home to two homes. Next week, I have labeled as Judaism uh, as ethics and beliefs because we're gonna combine this being and becoming units two and three. The following week, uh, universalism and particularism will match up directly with one unit. Um, and then um, I'm gonna to try to combine three units into one conversation about nationalism. So between nationalism, ultranationalism, fascism, the moral implications of Jewish nationalism and Israel's nation state law and its ramifications, that's all gonna be condensed into one session on nationalism. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll get into anti-Semitism, uh, whether, whether and how it's a divisive force and how it relates to anti-Zionism. So when is anti-Zionism anti-Semitism um, and, and how do those you know, terms kind of go together? That will all be one session. Uh, and then this idea of uh, unit 10 and um, unit 11 being about the accusation of dual loyalties. Um, and then this whole question that, you know, I grew up asking, what's good for the Jews? You know, is it good for the Jews? Um, when we talk about identity politics, um, we're gonna put those together um, because they, particularly in, in United States American society, right? That has been at the forefront of a lot of the conversations um, uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it was most recently um, brought up in the context of Jonathan Pollard being uh, released from the, the last version of his uh, incarceration. Um, he was under house arrest and he completed his 30 year um, uh, term and, and uh, actually about oh, two weeks ago now uh, flew to Israel and made Aliyah. Um, and, and for those of you who remember, um, both when he was uh, first uh, captured and then indicted, found guilty and, uh, and sentenced, uh, you know, there was a whole question of, was he uh, loyal just to Israel or to the United States? Uh, did he break one of those two loyalties? Um, how do we feel about it as Jews? Do we try to defend him? Do we try to reduce his sentence because it seemed unfair given how other spies had been treated? Uh, there were a lot of questions throughout the 80s, uh, and then it was reignited during the 90s, uh, the late 90s, um, as Bill Clinton um, uh, was leaving his presidency and was under pressure to uh, either commute the sentence or actually pardon Pollard. Um, and, and again, right, even literally two weeks ago, the question came up again, uh, but in a, in a different vein. So it's, this is real stuff and there's plenty more real stuff for like what's going on right now um, that we'll get to as well. The uh, last two classes um, are going to be a combination of 
these different models for uh, new ways of thinking about uh, Jewish peoplehood, family, consumer, shared believers, partners, investors, we're gonna put all of those into one session on models to consider. And then the conclusion, uh, what does it mean to experience peoplehood as a sense of being at home? Um, and whether that home is America or Israel or in some versions, uh, both, uh, how, what does that mean for Jewish peoplehood? A, a quick note on the schedule. Um, I'm following uh, what I have as the you know, Bethel calendar. I know there's been some, a little bit of confusion. So my expectation is that next week we'll have more people join us. Um, and uh, so we're gonna have like a, a four week run uh, and then there'll be a, a week off um, uh, before we pick up again um, uh, in mid-February and, and kind of go straight through for another uh, four week run. Uh, please let Debbie know, or uh, if she, you know, um, once I send out an email, if you wanna reply to me, um, uh, let me know if, if you think that we should in some way reconsider um, either the 13th or the 20th in particular, because that's the, the winter break, uh, President's Day uh, week vacation. Um, but again, the assumption is no one's going anywhere. Or if you do, uh, Shabbat afternoon is a great time to um, kind of tune into Torah. And uh, so uh, class is currently scheduled for both of those Saturdays. Okay, questions about the syllabus and any of the dates? Okay, let's start learning. Uh, no, this one. Can you share? So the PDF, um, when you download it, uh, or if you download it, right, um, from the online resource uh, is again, pretty lengthy. It starts off, I'm just scrolling quickly to the beginning, right? Um, title page, copyright, uh, and then gives you the introductory material. And you can see again, uh, 285 pages, just the beginning of the last unit. Um, the introductory materials has some credits and reminds us of what this is all about. Introductions to each unit. And then uh, a list of, of who the lecturers or guests are. The lecturer in the first lecture is Tal Becker. So I'll just pause here for a moment. Um, uh, a very eloquent um, uh, thinker and speaker. Um, and uh, he does a lot on Near East policy. Um, and uh, plenty of the other people. Here's uh, Yossi Klein Halevi. Uh, where did he go? He's right here. You may have read uh, his books or, or seen him speak or um, read articles that he uh, publishes in a variety of Jewish news outlets. Um, and then again, in addition to the people who give a lecture, there are interviewees. The first two are Dotan Ariely and uh, uh, Angela right. Buchdahl, right. both both rabbis, and I'll say more about them and their interview um, at the end of today. Okay, so these are other people um, uh, who end up being uh, part of the interview process. Uh, and then we get to the actual curriculum. The unit always begins with this, like here's a list of all the sources. Uh, rarely will I use all of them, but this week um, I'm, I'm going to touch on, uh, again, not all of each text, but pretty much all of these main sources. And there will also be background reading, um, which in general, I will uh, reference where appropriate. Uh, and, but uh, when I get to the end of the class, I'll also tell you which of the background readings I think would be most useful for continuing your learning if you wish to do that. Um, uh, in this particular instance, right, um, I, I'm not going to recommend Bialik uh, or this uh, extended version of, of Blaustein because um, we, we have an excerpt here um, that's uh, slightly different from this exchange that's listed 
Um, but Yuval Noah Harari's uh, book, truthfully, either that whole book or his, his more recent one, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, um, uh, is a great follow-up to the class. Um, but to read just one page with excerpts would be a really good use of your time. So I'll remind you of that at the end. So let's look at these sources. Um, when you think about what it means to be a Jewish people, you uh, likely are aware that um, the Passover story learn looms large. Okay, and I will just say this, the last time I talked this class, uh, people told me to make the screen larger so you could see the text better, right? So when I say interrupt me, right, that's the kind of thing that I learned by you kind of stepping in. Um, so, uh, so I hope this is large enough. If not, please say so. <laughs> Um, the Haggadah tells us, right, that we were slaves to Pharaoh um, and God took us out of Egypt, right? Um, and uh, then we were commanded, right, to discuss the Exodus, right? And in fact, everyone who discusses the Exodus at length is praiseworthy. So rabbis build on the idea that this story is foundational. I will tell you that in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, I think it's chapter 26, um, it describes the ritual for bringing the first fruits on Shavuot, uh, your Bikurim, and, and it says, Ve'anita ve'amarta, uh, aromea oved avi, right? So you shall uh, answer and you shall say. So like, you know, when we have a responsive reading in synagogue, right? Um, and we read the italicized portions. Imagine instead of that, it would be very much, I would say this first phrase, avadim hayinu, and then you would repeat it, avadim hayinu. So it used to be in the temple when you would bring your first fruits, the priest would say, arame aved avi, right? My father was a wandering Aramean, and you would repeat after the priest. So, so the text, even for an illiterate people were the verses that make up uh, that version of the story of the Exodus, including a lot of this language of with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, right? That is in that text. It would be memorized. It would be well known. So when we got to Passover, we could sit around and discuss at length, minimally, those verses, that story. Crucial question. Who is missing from the story? Moses. Thank you, Miriam. Moses is not in the story, right? So, so not for nothing, um, the rabbis uh, pick up on the Torah's choice, right? So either God's choice or the authors of the Torah, depending on your theology and um, the way you think about uh, the transmission of our, the text of our tradition, right? Um, takes Moses as a figure out of the story, puts the emphasis on God. Um, and, and I, I want to say this like uh, in, with emphasis, so I intend it. Um, I think also that for the human spirit to take Moses out and to leave it about God and the Jewish people is also to put the focus on the Jewish people as a people, um, and to, to make it about a, a kind of collective, uh, a human collective, as opposed to uh, making it really all about God. I think it's a, it's a conscious way of saying that, um, you know, if you want to know the most important story to the Jewish people, it's this idea of going from slavery to freedom, right, that God happens to be a part of. And we're not even going to talk about the guy who helped make it happen very conscious choices, right? Um, and then again, the rabbis build on the existence of both the text from Deuteronomy being a, a known liturgical um, telling of the story, plus the actual Passover Seder, so to speak, during the time of the temple, um, which is to say you would bring a lamb and offer it, you would roast it, you weren't allowed to boil it, I'm, I'm doing daily Tor Tor Talmud study <laughs> known as Dafyomi. And right now we're talking about like, like 
you know, sort of all the rules of cooking, not just because of chametz or, um, or not, but also um, uh, whether you could, you know, in any way boil the meat of the Paschal lamb? Because the answer is no, we're supposed to be like rich people. And if the fat drips off, we don't have to capture it. We don't, we don't, we don't have to get all that, that precious nutrition from the oil. Um, we want to act like rich people and let the, the fats of the Paschal lamb drip and burn and, 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 uh, and have that go up to God, right? The smell, the reach nichoach, um, the, the pleasing scent uh, ascend to the heavens. So, um, so it used to be, right? You would bring your Paschal lamb, you would have matzah and maror, and you would tell the story even before we had anything like a Haggadah and even before the rabbis were sort of like the, the version of Jewish practice. Um, but once the rabbis are, are kind of in charge, they tell us, In every generation, a person is obligated to see themselves as if he or she was personally redeemed from Egypt. Foundational story. Okay, and this is important because um, one of the aspects of humans as opposed to other species is that what has allowed us to kind of um, succeed beyond sort of minimal numbers uh, is the use of language to tell stories. Um, and in particular, uh, myths, okay? So um, again, these myths could actually be true historical events. Like some people say the Exodus happened exactly as it's presented. Some people say, it happened kind of as it was presented. Some people say it didn't even happen, but we believe it anyway, right? Rabbi David Wolpe, Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, uh, about 15 years ago, maybe more, gave a, a famous sermon um, where he says the Exodus didn't happen, uh, but I believe it anyway, right? Um, and, uh, and and what's it, right? Because like knowing the story helps to bridge generation to generation and from from Persian Jew, like in Los Angeles, his community has a lot of Persian Jews and, um, you know, very American Jews, third, fourth generation, uh, or Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, um, doesn't matter. Uh, again, you could be religious or secular, right? You know this story. Uh, this story helps to kind of define who we are. Um, and, uh, so then the question is, what other stories do we have, right, that might either support this experience of defining who we are as a people or complicate it, right? So um, many will draw on this particular story to say, like, why do we care about others who are underprivileged? Why do we always, like, root for the underdog? Um, it's because we were once slaves, right? And the Torah teaches us to do that. The prophets expound upon that. Um, and, and so it's this ongoing narrative over thousands of years as to like what it means to be a Jew and why, okay? Um, and, and for all of that, right, um, the first time we're actually called a people is not by ourselves. It's, 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 you know, this sort of we were slaves. It doesn't say like, oh, we became, you know, a great nation uh, anywhere in this particular text. Um, the first time we are called a people is by Pharaoh, who refers to, to us as Am B'nai Yisrael. Um, the Israelite people, this is like a little bit of a weak translation in the English. Oftentimes the Torah calls the Jews B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, the Israelites. Those are sort of common English translations. Right? Great, that's really helpful because Jacob, our ancestor, was renamed Israel after he wrestled the angel. And he had 12 sons and a daughter, or at least one daughter that we know about. And, um, uh, and they became the tribes of Israel. And everyone ended up in Egypt. And a couple hundred years later, a Pharaoh arose who knew uh, Joseph not, right? Who didn't know Joseph, um, a different kind of Pharaoh. And historically, that actually matches for those of you who like this kind of scholarly stuff. I'll just say that like, the Hyksos um, pharaohs, the Hyksos Egyptians who are kind of Northern Egyptian um, seem to be the period in which 
um, Joseph would have risen to power um, and Moses might have even been welcomed into, into the palace in some way. But, um, but the Nile pharaohs from the south, right, were a different kind of uh, Egyptian uh, uh, dynasty. And, and so they would treat the Jews differently when they came to power. Um, and uh, so the Hebrew here has this addition of the word am, um, meaning people. So all the times that like the Torah refers to the Jews as B'nai Yisrael, um, uh, this addition of Am um, that, that Pharaoh engages in um, is, is uh, a, a tell. It's a very important, significant word. Um, and and uh, it's a rare phrase. It's, it's basically the only time that we're referred to uh, in the Torah, at least, as Am Yisrael, Am B'nai Yisrael. Um, and, and we're being called that again by somebody else. So in particular for this Pharaoh, it's worth noting that he is kind of creating a contrast between the Egyptians and the Jews. And he's doing it, um, you know, negatively. So this is a kind of also ex early expression of anti-Semitism, um, which is part of our story. Um, uh, the other famous example of anti-Semitism, right? Uh, and I'm setting up next week's session really, right? So this is like ethnicity, as a kind of uh, anti-Jewish expression. Um, Esther, right, Haman is very clearly uh, frustrated by Mordechai um, because Mordechai would not kneel or bow low, right? And uh, Haman goes on to say that, um, uh, where is it here? I have to scroll down. Haman said to Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among all the other peoples in all the provinces of your realm whose laws are different and who do not obey the king's laws, right? Uh, and, and it's not in your interest to tolerate them. So this is about our behaviors, our, our, um, our way of organizing ourselves, right? And again, uh, people, as a people. Um, this is in verse eight, so, uh, right? Um, there's a, there's a, an, a people, an am, Echad, one people, right, um, mixed in among the other peoples of the Persian Empire. Um, so that'll set up next week's the Judaism of being and of becoming, right, um, our ethics and our beliefs, um, how we live and, and what we guide ourselves by. Questions so far? Okay. I'm gonna complicate things by going back because maybe maybe you wanna think about um, place, this whole idea of homes, okay? So um, if I've set up the peoplehood issue as the stories we tell define us as a people, Yuval Noah Harari goes into kind of great detail in terms of the kind of scholarly research on some of what that's about. And, um, and I'll say more about it in a little bit. Um, we have this idea that we can also be identified um, from the outside, right, by aggressors in particular, by threats. Um, what about from the inside? What about our interior perspective and that whole idea of being at home? So if you remember, Avram grew up or was born in Ur of the Chaldees, kind of at the, the base of the Tigris and Euphrates. He moves to Haran with his family. Um, he's brought there by his father. Haran is sort of at the top of the Fertile Crescent, um, closer to the Syria-Iraq border. Um, and, uh, and it's there that he breaks the idols in his father's shop, right? Uh, and as a result of that, or whatever other stories are not actually in the Torah, but that we kind of tell about Avram, uh, God says at the opening of Parshat Lech Lecha, go forth from uh, your land from your birthplace and from the house of your father to a land that I will show you, right? And I'm going to make you a great nation, make your name great, you'll be a blessing. Um, and Debbie Friedman kind of uh, expanded upon this and it made it uh, gender inclusive, um, uh, but really, right, this idea of and, and focusing on the blessing. Um, Note what verse number that is. Genesis chapter 12, verse one and verse two, okay? By verse 10, 
not only has Avram and Sarah, not only have they arrived in Canaan and been said, this is the land, uh, they find famine. And what do they do? You just got to this magic place that God's going to make uh, as a home for us to be a great nation. It's part of the whole blessing, the promise. What does Avram do? He goes to Egypt. Wait a minute. I thought Israel was supposed to be like our home, right? Um, so even from the very start, the idea that Israel is our promised land, is our home um, for Avram in, in eight short verses, it fails. And what happens when Avram, by the way, is in Egypt? He becomes rich. Partly because things just go well there, partly because Pharaoh's attracted to his wife, uh, who he says is actually his sister. It's a little complicated, but they, they leave Egypt, really wealthy shepherding families, right? Uh, and so much so that he and Lot have to divide up where they're gonna live when they get back to Israel, okay? So in one in the same shot, right? Matter of 10 verses total, we get go to Israel, Oh, wait, Israel's not hospitable. Leave Israel, be successful, and then come back to Israel. So this whole notion of like Israel being like the home, complicated. So, and then, by the way, right, 1,000, 1,500 years uh, later, the Babylonians come, destroy Jerusalem, exile the Jews back to Babylonia, um, uh, Jeremiah is the prophet of the era, and uh, and he says something really interesting because he he's actually I, I've been studying Jeremiah because he's my namesake, right? Um, uh, when King Josiah was trying to restore proper Jewish practice to the temple and to uh, the government, um, he was like, "This is great. Everyone should like love what's going on here." But then then the next king or so showed up and wasn't so good. And the next king or so wanted to ally with Egypt because things had been pretty good with an alliance with Egypt. But Jeremiah had prophesied that God was going to use Babylonia, that a great ruler would come, Nebuchadnezzar, right? Would, would develop in, in Babylonia and defeat the Egyptians. So, so, and the Jews would be cut, caught in the crossfire. Jeremiah tried to convince the government to ally with Babylonia. They didn't. Jerusalem's destroyed, right? We go into exile, but what does Jeremiah say about it? He says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and get sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease and seek the welfare to which I have exiled you and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its prosperity, you shall prosper. Now, just to, you know, kind of like make sure we're good on our uh, language in, in American society, because I am sure um, that from time to time, and, and I've seen it in some of the, in the wake of this week's events, um, you know, why Jews should pray for the government, right? For, uh, of, of the United States, right? drawing on Jeremiah's verse here, seek the welfare of the city. Um, it really means city-state, like the, the, the Greek polis, the polity, um, politics you can hear in that. Um, uh, but the prosperity, right, um, uh, to which we're supposed to seek is actually a kind of completeness. It's a shalom, so it's either peace or completeness, it's fulfillment. Prosperity is actually a pretty good term, but I don't want you to think it's just economic, right? Um, bye bye. Yes. Yeah. Uh, before we get too far away from it, a backup is is there a difference between the Hebrew word am and goy? Yes. Um, so goy tends to be an early expression of uh, nation, of like a kind of nationalism kind of nation. So um, uh, the Babylonians would be a goy. Um, 
and, you know, and, and when we go up here to, uh, right, to be a goy gadol, um, uh, sorry, I'll just highlight the goy part. Um, uh, the idea would be in, in many ways a, um, a kind of uh, physically boundaried people. Right, so, um, and that's, that kind of overemphasizes the, the point about Israel supposedly being, right, the, a home for the Jews, um, because when goy is, is used as opposed to am, it generally refers to, like, again, the Greeks, the Romans, the, the Persians, the Assyrians, um, uh, the Babylonians, the Edomites, the Moabites, right, all these different uh, peoples, um, but, but less so as as a kind of uh, collective, um, uh, less so as a kind of ethnicity, and much more so as, again, a, a kind of a country or nation, a nation state. Um, uh, and, and let me just say this too, that like, I didn't do all that research myself. That's my reading of the scholars I've been introduced to. So it may be that somebody thinks differently, um, but that's, that's the understanding that I've been given. So just go, just, I'm sorry. So one, one can be an arm, but scattered throughout the world, but yes. until you are collected into a specific hunk of geography and defining your own uh, structure and business, uh, mm -hmm. then you, you'll be a goy. Correct. And so Danny? also a goy would indicate that you have land. Yes, yes, right. Um, uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So, so here's the thing. So Jeremiah, going back to where we were, um, and thank you for the question, um, is saying like, look, live in exile, prosper. Um, uh, it's good for you. Uh, if it's good for them, <laughs> right. Um, simultaneous in terms of like, scholarly tradition, texts of our tradition, is this famous psalm, okay, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, uh, we sat down and wept, right? Why were we sitting down and weeping? Because we were thinking of Zion, our lost, right, um, central organizing place, the thing that made us a goy as opposed to necessarily an am, and uh, our tormentors, right, our captors, uh, made us sing, sing a song of Zion, right? And, and we, how could we, um, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. So, so literally in the same kind of like uh, historical moment, uh, we have a dual message. One is thrive in exile because it's part of the promise. It's part of God's greater plan. Uh, and it, if it's good for them, it's good for you or me, good for us. And we long to return. When we did have that status, not just as an am, but as a goy, life was really special. Our, our relationship to God was also really special. And, um, and so that's how we went from sort of like no home, like Avram having to like help us create a home. We go in, you know, in and out of Egyptian exile, right? And then, um, meaning we go from Canaan to Egypt, back to Canaan. Uh, Isaac also goes back to Egypt. Um, uh, Joseph first, but then J Jacob and all the tribes go to Egypt. Moses leads us out of Egypt. We, with Joshua, retake the land of Canaan and settle there, have a Jewish state uh, under the kings Saul first, but then the Davidic dynasty, all the way through, again, the time of Jeremiah, um, uh, and, and frankly, um, only 30 years after the temple was destroyed, um, Nebuchadnezzar falls, Cyrus the Great becomes the Babylonian ruler, and he has this return. Um, uh, he offers most Jews the opportunity to come back. Only 30,000 Jews actually um, go back to Israel. Ezra and Nehemiah, or Nehemiah um, reestablish the temple uh, and Torah reading, right? But a whole host of Jews stay in Babylonia for thousands of years. Well, for at least a thousand years. Um, uh, the rabbis of the Talmud, right, um, exchange learning with rabbis who end up um, 
uh, in the wake of uh, the Second Temple's uh, both development and the Maccabees' defense and cleansing of it, and then uh, the destruction by the Romans, right? The, the rabbis of Israel um, uh, come to prominence and they communicate with the rabbis of Babylonia and they go back and forth to establish what Judaism looks like very much in our day um, through the year 600 um, when the Talmud is completed. Uh, there are great scholars, the Gaonim, who uh, get asked questions by the Jews of Spain and Italy and Morocco and uh, Tunisia and um, Cairo. Uh, letters come all the way back to Babylonia, <laughs> to the Babylonian rabbis, again, who are descendants of Jews who maybe never even left from 586, right? They had a chance in 555 to go back to Israel. And they didn't. Um, but some did, right? And those who did reestablished the temple, reestablished the Jewish state. Um, and it was complicated under all the different you know, sort of empires, the Greeks, the Romans, right? Um, uh, until, again, we, we were uh, exiled uh, in the wake of um, not just the revolt that led to the destruction of the temple in the year 70, but also the Bar Kokhba revolt in, in 115, 135, somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, we, we were not allowed in Jerusalem, then we weren't allowed in other parts of Israel. Um, but because we had established a home outside of Israel, we were able to kind of continue. And yet our, our liturgy and our poetry had us kind of always longing for, the rabbis keep talking about the Jerusalem, the temple, Zion, right from out of Zion comes uh, Torah. That's where all learning is supposed to come from. Um, so we, we keep those dual I uh, paths of like, I'm not at home, I'm in exile, right? Uh, uh, or, right, I'm, a, I'm at home to some degree, right? And my real home I've lost. So this idea of two homes that like, eh, I don't know. Um, we had no home, one home, Israel, maybe two homes, maybe not. It was always in conflict. Even in our medieval history, we would move from one town to another whenever the Lord, the Duke, the King, <laughs> the Queen would like the Jews, wanted our, our commerce, our advice, our money, our connections. They would let us live there. Then they would kick us out when things didn't look good. Really, truly, until America. Because even England, under the Kings of England, like sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. When America decided to have the First Amendment, right, and freedom of religion, and um, you know, all religions were kind of equal and not controlled by the government, that was the first time that we, as a minority, were given the opportunity to also belong as citizens and not to be excluded. Now, doesn't mean there wasn't anti-Semitism. Doesn't mean that like there were issues like Peter Stuyvesant, you know, before um, when when we were still in the colonies process, like wanted to keep the Jews out. We had to have the uh, Dutch Jews in Amsterdam say like, well, you know, Peter Stuyvesant, you kind of work for us because we're you're a Dutch colony, right? All of that history is still you know relevant, but by and large, the American promise, the story of America is a story in which Jews are equal to Catholics who otherwise might have been persecuted, to Protestants, right? Um, and now by extension to other religious groups, um, let alone other uh, kinds of minorities, right? Um, and, and that comes to fruition in Jacob Blaustein uh, in this, this little piece uh, that's excerpted for us here. So I'm gonna share it with you. Um, in 1950, so Israel has been established. Uh, Jacob Blaustein speaking to the American Jewish community. He's a, a senior member of the um, reform movement at this stage. He says, um, there are a few unthinking Jewish nationalists who appear to want to assign to Israel the role of ingathering Jews from all over the world. Well, that, that was the promise of, uh, of Israel, right? Like uh, it's, it's in Hatikva and it's, it's actually in um, uh, um, the prayer we say right before Shema in the morning, right? The Havienu Lishalom Merabach and Futa Aretz, right? Like this is supposed to be the ingathering of the Jews. And, We've been waiting 2,000 plus years for this moment. Uh, but he says that's a false belief um, uh, that would make Jewish life outside of Israel in exile, as they put it, 
to say that it's without spiritual value, cultural significance, or hope of personal or group security. Um, right? Jews in America in 1950, he felt, were very comfortable, very safe, able to kind of live the life that they wanted. And he says, we repudiate vigorously the suggestion that American Jews are in exile. The future of American Jewry of our children and our children's children is entirely linked with the future of America. We have no alternative. We want no alternative. Um, and again, he's not the only American Jew. Uh, so he represents one version of uh, what our attachment to America might look like as a people, because there are plenty of American Jews who are fervent Zionists, right? Who were supporting the establishment of Israel, um, whether it was raising funds or moving there ourselves or otherwise um, promoting Israel as a, as a place for us to live. So um, here's, here's what I wanna kind of like have us uh, finish up with. Um, uh, let's, let me change the share to uh, here to back to my, hold on. Um, we did those pages. Okay, so, um, Before I do that, um, I, I want to kind of just note that, um, right, the stories that we tell as American Jews about Israel um, help to define, right, our attitude towards this idea of, of um, two parallel homes, right, or, or one home of where we actually belong and another home that is a version of exile. And, um, and which stories we tell about what each home looks like is really important. So the more we talk about America as a place that is um, filled with anti-Semites um, and uh, 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 people are always out to get us. Um, and I'm not saying that they're not, right? There's plenty of anti-Semitism and we've been witness to it. Um, and, and I'm not just referring to like Pittsburgh and Poway and shootings, you know, in our in our actual synagogues, but also to the degree to which um, uh, Wednesday uh, you had people wearing sweatshirts that said, you know, Camp Auschwitz, um, uh, and and at other times, you know, even in in the last uh, number of years, um, uh, that you know Jews are accused of um, controlling the media or Hollywood or the banks or whatever else, right? Like that's a very real possibility um, uh, that, that this place is inhospitable to us, right? Even as, by the way, Jews are so successful and so at home in this society that like Steve Mnuchin is the treasury secretary and he's in Israel right now, right? Um, and, uh, and Jews do have prominent roles in uh, a number of different uh, sectors of the economy or of society. Um, and, and we have been largely successful. And for some of our young people, they have no idea what anti-Semitism looks like, right? Because the Holocaust was still long ago and uh, some of the ways in which um, they have grown up has, have just been really comfortable. Both stories are real, right? So which we emphasize will change our attitude towards this place as our home. And the same thing about Israel. I grew up um, uh, with uh, Hebrew school teachers who left Israel um, and, and what they told me and my classmates uh, uh, as we were kind of like, you know, developing our, our early sense of what Israel is about. It's all about the pioneers and, and the kibbutzim and recovering the land and recovering our soul. And uh, it had nothing to do with religion. Um, uh, and so it was this sort of very secular uh, um, Zionist story of, of being a goy, right? Of being a nation with laws, you know, uh, and normal, by the way. So, so what is the definition of a kind of um, uh, a people at home? Is a people who have safety and security, right? So Israel is the strong army, and I was taught about all the wars, um, uh, and I kind of grew into the first intifada, and and had to like learn how the world saw Israel in light of the Intifada. 
that we would be uh, able to be normal, which is to say like, there would also be Jewish criminals and Jewish, you know, experiences of, of regular economic, you know, success, failure, whatever else. So Israel is this like, you know, laws and people who break the law and jails, this is like, this is a dream uh, of the early Zionists is that like, we would be so normal that we would have like all the same problems that any other country would have and exceptional, right? So uh, for all the ways that, that ancient Canaan or Israel was inhospitable, right? Um, uh, in addition to all our Nobel laureates um, from around the world uh, in um, the uh, you know, early part or even uh, through most of the 20th century um, today, you know, Israel has figured out how, instead of being dependent on rain, to turn the Mediterranean into drinkable water and how to irrigate um, uh, in the desert in a way that um, makes use of brackish water that's deep, deep in the earth or right, the water that's being used in regular ways is, is being used um, even more efficiently and solar power and wind power um, to, uh, to help propel society and and I don't know about you, but I see in the Jewish press, the fact that the vaccination rate for Corona uh, virus, you know, COVID-19 is so high in Israel that by the end of March, everyone over the age of 16 is expected to have been vaccinated fully, like not just one dose, but two doses, right? Is due to Israeli, quote, Jewish ingenuity, right? Uh, and exceptionalism, uh, even as sometimes that exceptionalism is turned against Israel, right? There's a double standard at the United Nations that anything that Israel does that is a human rights violation uh, or even looks like a human rights violation, right? Will be brought up to the highest level, but like, you know, China or Russia or any other country who commits the same or worse or far worse, we don't even talk about it, right? So that, that exceptionalism, uh, all three of those basic kind of identifiers, safety, normalcy, and exceptionalism, right, have been achieved in Israel, and which stories we tell kind of affect us. So um, I want to I wanna ask you to think about for our next class and as a way of kind of maybe getting to know each other a little bit better, right? What, what story about Israel, what person did you meet or, or what experience did you have has most deeply influenced how you view Israel for you personally, right? That's gonna be kind of like your assignment for next week. I'm gonna ask whoever is willing to share their story. Um, uh, my story changed pretty radically after I actually visited Israel when I lived there for a year as part of my rabbinic training, when I went back to see friends uh, during the second intifada um, and, and when I brought students on birthright afterwards, right? My, my story has changed significantly. Um, but I went thinking, right, that Israel was a, a land of a pioneering spirit uh, and we could reclaim the land and socialism was maybe a good idea. Um, it's still in Kibbutzim had children's houses and not like, you know, that you would stay with your parents. Um, Moshavs weren't really big yet. Um, uh, and and I, I brought that perspective with me for my first visit and for decades after um, uh, and had to wrestle with um, how that played with other stories I was hearing. So what story or person or experience, right, most influenced your view of Israel, um, your story of Israel, right? Uh, and if you want to pursue some of what I talked about more, again, I highly recommend uh, this, um, the Yuval Harari's um, excerpts on, in the source book on page eight. Okay, it's one page but it kind of lays out the, the function of story. And I will tell you that you're seeing a lot of this um, right now in, in our press that, right, part of what happened on Wednesday is that a group of people or groups of people had access to a story that was not, that was not um, uh, the same as, right, quote, most other people. Um, and, and the real question is, right, who, knew that story uh, and who didn't, right? Uh, and, and for example, why weren't the police prepared for people who are in, in, in depth in that story? Um, uh, what does it mean for someone like Vice President Pence to have been part of that story and then to have that story turned against him? Uh, the story matters. And when we think about healing as a country, right? Joe Biden saying we should heal 
um, is, is, a, is a kind of lofty, wonderful um, uh, hope, right? But the actual telling of a story that brings us together or finding of stories that help to bridge some of these divides is going to be the challenge going forward. And Yuval uh, Harari kind of lays out some of why that's important. Again, if you want even more about it, read that whole book, Sapiens, or um, if you want like a, a different version that gets into all kinds of issues of nationalism as well, um, uh, more contemporary issues than his 21 lessons for the 21st century. Um, May I just go back for a moment to what Jacob Blaustein said? Yes, please, Mary. I remember, I don't know the exact year, but when Louis Brandeis was Supreme Court Justice, he made the statement at that time, Jews were being accused of dual loyalty. Yes. And he made the statement that any Jew who was loyal to Israel was a better American citizen because our values are the same as the values of Israel. And of course that still holds true today. And that's why we're such close allies with the yes. United States. Yes, right. And, and, uh, and um, you know, APAC to, in, in its bipartisan statements often uses that kind of language. Um, uh, uh, in addition to Brandeis, uh, there, um, there's a lot of uh, more recently looking at Thomas Jefferson um, uh, as a figure who understood the importance of, of Palestine then, right? But the idea of Zionism. And so, so the evangelical Christian community in, in our country um, would support Brandeis, right? Like to love Israel is to love America. And by the way, I wanna say this like early on, right? A large part of the Jewish community who supported Trump at any stage in, in his campaigns or his presidency, right? Uh, was basing themselves in that value. And, and if we're gonna have this conversation about like going forward as a, as a, as a country, right? And we need to understand, right? The, the tension between doing that kind of Zionism out of um, uh, a kind of um, uh, statement of, of politics and, and, and belonging that's, that's maybe, maybe more ethnic than about um, values, right, comes into direct conflict with Jews who think that America, I'm sorry, that Israel represents democracy in the Middle East and, um, uh, and uh, that Israel could live up to certain Jewish values. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, right? Like the fact that, that the army will uh, drop leaflets before any bombing, right? Like what other army in the world does that, right? That's the, the liberal you know, Jewish like uh, community saying, right? Supporting Israel is an American thing to do. And, and we should be able to have that conversation. Right, and so we're going to look at texts that kind of help us to to get into that. Right, so Miriam, thank you for for raising Brandeis up, um, uh, and and it's going to be a conversation we continue. I want to um, uh, reference one other version of how that conversation continues, which is this video um, that I showed you at the very beginning of. If you skip to the thirty third minute, that's around when the interview begins, and um, Tal Becker, uh, I'll. I'll I'll be honest, like his lecture doesn't say hard, much more than I said. <laughs> I kind of like presented to you what he presented. Um, but when he interviews Angela Bookdahl and Dotan Ariely, uh, it's a fascinating uh, experience. Um, Angela Bookdahl is a Korean American reform rabbi, right? So she's got all of these tags. She talks about not knowing whether she was Korean or American as a child, because uh, both were her home. She talks about visiting Israel and like being seen in some ways fully as Jewish and in some ways not at all Jewish because she doesn't look like a Jew, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, on top of this particular interview, it's worth noting that she gave a very moving Kol Nidre sermon uh, that's on YouTube. You can just Google uh, Rabbi Angela Bookdahl, um, race, uh, and she addresses racism in our country uh, through her own lens um, uh, as a Jew of color. Uh, very moving, and it gets into like what are these stories that that you know kind of um, 
define who we are and where are there bridges and opportunities to bring us together. Dotan Ariely talks about growing up on a kibbutz, right? And, and not seeing Judaism as something that would exist outside of Israel because like to be Israeli is to be Jewish. And then she learns about all these like, you know, not necessarily like uh, Orthodox versions of Judaism and, and how much there is to learn um, about being Jewish from Jews outside of Israel. Um, and, uh, and their interaction is just really precious. So again, if you have time, it's about 20 minutes long, you could um, access the video and watch it. So questions, comments, um, uh, anything else as we kind of... This, um, just a very quick uh, one. Uh, uh, I logged on a little bit late. Um, if I go to the uh, uh, Hartman on line a website that I can get the PDF on the video that you're talking about. You can get both. So I'll just, I'll share it one more time. It, it will look like, um, hold on one moment. Uh, and then Jeremy, you'll email that to me and I, I know everybody who's here. So I'll make sure I email it to everybody who's here also. For the link. Yes. So, um, uh, so when you use the, the login information, um, uh, you'll get into your own version of this, okay? Um, and uh, it won't have the leader's guide because that's for myself or Rabbi Patron, right? But it will say this source book PDF. And if you click on that, it'll open another tab, um, which uh, new share, um, right? Has the actual book, right? And, and again, like you could download it and print it. Uh, or if you want uh, to have all the texts for like everything and all the extra readings, you could um, order a printed version. And if you scroll down after the source book will be each of these videos or a video for every unit, okay? Um, and like I said, I'm not gonna, look next week I'm doing unit two and three together, right? So the likelihood of my showing um, uh, more than, two clips is, is low. <laughs> so you always have this as a resource if you wanna expand your learning. And you can download the video, you can just have it pop up and play. The HD would be a very high quality version. Um, it, it'll take a lot of your internet, but you could do that. Uh, and, right, you should also have access to Ravi Bitran's prior I Engage teaching curriculum, Dilemmas of Faith, and if you click on it, it will open also a source book and um, they loaded the videos differently back then. So each lecture, you know, has a, has a different version of how you access it. But, you know, you can, the learning can definitely be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and I will work with Debbie to distribute, again, the key takeaways from today's session, a recording of this class, ways to access um, all the online materials um, and also the spreadsheet, I mean, sorry, the slideshow, the PowerPoint um, that I used. So you could kind of follow along with class again if, uh, if you felt you missed something. Okay. Thank you. Have a good week. Shabuotov. Thank you. Shabuotov. 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 Shabu